Hello and welcome to this week's Dividend Cafe. I am David Bonson, Managing Partner at the Bonson Group. Uh, getting ready to go into our 16th year of bringing you uh, the Dividend Cafe. Uh, we began in September of 2008, and now here we are getting ready to go into September of 2024. And uh, with September means uh, the end of summer and the beginning of fall. And with the beginning of fall means the beginning of USC football. And many of you will recall that I devoted an entire Dividend Cafe to an analogy of decades of my love affair with USC football and tracking that with markets along the way. And I thought it was an utterly brilliant Dividend Cafe. And about four of you felt the same. And many, many thousands of you may not have. But I just want to let you know I'm not doing that again. All I'm doing is mentioning that USC is playing LSU in Las Vegas this Sunday as they launch their football season, and I am excited. I also am excited for the fall season. It's my favorite time of year. It has been since my childhood, and uh, this has been a very, very busy summer, and I don't expect fall to let up, and I don't want it any other way. We work full-time and year-round at our company. Uh, markets don't sleep, but here's the thing. Um, there's a lot to say about this market, and I'm going to say a lot of it today. The market, the economy, uh, certain macro issues, but it was one of these dividend cafes where I sort of jumped around a lot of different topics, and I just kind of want to do uh, the, same, the same thing for you. Um, go through piece by piece, kind of almost uh, potpourri, if you will. You know, one of the things that I think is most interesting in terms of what has happened here in the last month in the market is that the markets rebounded. There had been a really, you know, a big kind of uh, uh, volatility spike in late July, early August. And, and I've talked about it kind of almost oh, to some degree or another every week this month uh, where markets, you know, dropped a bunch and then uh, rallied right back. And the Dow, you know, hit an all time high a few days ago and so forth. But I do think it's worth noting that if somebody had said a month ago that we're going to go to earnings season and on the other side of it, Microsoft, NVIDIA, Amazon, Google, and Tesla, five of those so-called Magnificent Seven are all going to be lower than they were when they started and that the market would be higher and pushing all-time highs. I, I wouldn't have believed it. I don't know very many people would have. But it is a testimony to what has happened this month with the defensive sectors in the market, um, to some degree utilities, uh, to a large degree consumer staples and healthcare. Um, financials had dropped a lot, but they then also had a very significant rally back. REITs being another space, some would consider that um, more uh, in a defensive sector, but it certainly was one that had a tremendous move in August. And so you had a broadening of market participation and that significant breadth offset the fact that some of those key players were not participating. And uh, it will be very interesting to see where we go from here. Uh, those names not getting a spike from their quarterly results and not getting a spike from uh, the Fed announcements and Fed expectations and things like that. I don't know what the catalyst would be at this point. And I think that this, you know, indicates some degree of uh, ongoing tran leadership transition. Now, I want to repeat that this is not like me to try to forecast exactly what it means, because that's not what I'm doing now. I've really never done it. And I don't believe it can be done. Um, whether we're talking about the month of September or the remainder of the year, um, it, it's totally unclear what the overall market's going to do. And I say that every week, but I'm right now saying something more particular. It's totally unclear what the leadership space in the market may be. Uh, my belief that overpriced things eventually revert to the mean has never, ever been connected to timing. I have no reason to ever doubt 
that something that is overpriced can become more overpriced before it becomes fairly priced. I, I've seen it happen so many times in my career, I've lost count. And so I don't have any motivation, let alone any intellectual attachment to the idea that um, o overpriced things are, are at a ceiling. They can always make new ceilings. I'm not interested in investing in that potential uh, expansion of a ceiling, uh, which is another way of saying, um, uh, you know, a bubble becoming bigger before it burst. However, there is a, a good reason to believe that some of this rotation where ratios revert to the mean relationships between different sectors and their valuations, uh, the overall growth value dichotomy, um, that, 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 kind of transition in leadership is happening. And it one day here, or one week here, I think are very, very um, anecdotal at best. But this right now more fundamentally feels to be playing out. But again, that, that could change. Um, and, and there's reason to believe it, it will be happening, whether it's happening right now or not. Now, the other question that I think is fair to ask has to do with the future of... Um, well, I, I guess the the economic conditions that the markets respond to in the course of a Fed loosening cycle. So I've talked a lot about how it's, it's not it's not a super high percentage, but it's over fifty percent of the time that six to twelve months after the mark after the Fed begins cutting rates, the markets are generally lower. And, and the reason, and that may be counterintuitive to people because we can think of certain times when the Fed cut rates and markets went up a lot. But when you give an unexpected stimulus to something in conditions that are more benign, you, you know, you just take things that are maybe kind of attractive with their fundamental profit environment and then you just give it a higher valuation because of a, a lower discount rate by lowering the, the Fed funds, that's that that you expect prices to go higher. But the majority of the time, the central bank is cutting rates is in response to weakening economic conditions. And I've talked about this more often uh, recently. Another way to put it, you could argue, is, well, if you get a recession, you don't usually get markets going higher. And the Fed is often cutting because they held policy rates too high too long and the market moved in recession, the economy moved into recession. This, a lot of these things feel different right now, and there's five pieces I want to remind everyone about in this uh, rate cutting cycle we're about to begin um, that just provide a little context. Every situation is different historically. There are different particulars and, 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 and specific circumstances that will drive that response. And that's why throughout history, there are times when markets went up and other times markets went down. And the, and the things that were happening in the economy were different. Um, in this case, there's a number of things that are different, and therefore I think it's a little bit harder to predict. Uh, certainly if we get into a recession, you know, I expect corporate profits by definition to drop and I expect stock prices to drop. But can corporate profits drop even if we don't go into recession? They can. And therefore can stock prices potentially respond negatively? I, do, I think that's on the table. But here, here's a lot of the the issue, the the bigger picture, the full milieu that I think is worth noting in the historical context. Number one is that markets didn't exactly decline a lot during the rate hiking cycle. <laughs> They're up, you know, as, as you well know, even, even despite the big drop in 2022. There may be less room to rebound when the cutting begins because there wasn't a whole lot of drop when the hiking took place. Number two. The markets have had more time to price in these pending rate cuts than almost any period I've studied. The, the Fed began this so-called pause 15 months ago. By the time they cut, it will have been 15 months. And that's a very long time for markets to essentially front run or discount what they're expecting to take place. And, and that's not, not very historic, historically common. Uh, number three, economic conditions have slowed, but they haven't weakened. They've softened. They haven't fallen. They're less robust. They're not terrible. In other words, I don't believe we know 
exactly where the economy itself is going. And a 4.3% unemployment rate that ends up hugging around 4%, that's going to speak to an okay economic landing as opposed to if it gets above 5% and, and maybe even further than that. Um, so there's some question about what the economic conditions will prove to be from here. Uh, number four, S&P earnings growth is already expected to be well into double digits next, next year to 11, 12, 13%. Uh, S&P valuations are already north of 20% or 20, excuse me, 20 times um, earnings. So multiple expansion is not likely uh, regardless of the economic fundamentals. So there may be a bit of a ceiling in place relative to some of the historical periods when the Fed began uh, theoretically boosting valuations by, by dropping the discount rate. And then number five, there's another monetary tool on the table that no one really talks about besides just interest rates, and that's quantitative easing. The use of that tool by the Fed to either continue tightening, to stop tightening, or to actually uh, move into more accommodation, a proactive loosening and easing of monetary conditions. All three of those options are on the table. And I think it'll be in this case inadequate to talk about just the impact of rates to financial conditions and therefore market expectations without understanding what the Fed may do with this other, you know, kind of twin uh, sibling of policy, which is in the quantitative tightening, quantitative easing. All right, moving on to a couple other uh, miscellaneous items. I just want to point out about the VIX, which, you know, they sometimes it's called the fear index. It's a volatility index. And it really speaks to what price people are willing to pay for protection around the up and down movements and so forth. And and the VIX had been just at historically low levels for a long period of time, coming into late July, uh, sitting somewhere between $12 and $13, you know, for a long time. And it exploded higher for that late July, early August market hubbub, and then it, and then it dropped. Um, but it did not drop back to 13 or 12. It dropped back to 15, 16, 17, right now sitting around 16 as I'm recording. So it's still moderate, it's still low, still healthy, um, but it isn't back to where there was almost no fear priced in at all, but it also is well off of where there was just a kind of pandemonium fear outbreak with people buying VIX in the 50, 60 range, you know, back in early August. Uh, so I see this as a healthy thing. I don't like it when I think uh, protection is underpriced. It speaks to a complacency that the contrarian in me doesn't like. But the VIX, even as markets came back to a high, the VIX did not come back to a low, worth noting. All right, so I don't want to get too deep into the election talk yet because I am now working on this white paper that I plan to publish next month analyzing the election, what to expect for investors as we go into the November election and trying to do a real thorough, objective and reasonably nonpartisan assessment of what, what my expectations are out of the presidential race as well as, you know, the congressional, both Senate and House uh, races. And I got to go through various topics and, and policy specifics and, and there's a lot of history assessed in it. And I do this every four years and I love doing it. And this year I hope to make it the best ever. Uh, but in some of the preparation and research and so forth I was doing this week, I, I want to share one thought, kind of a sneak preview. Um, there is a stark difference between both candidates on some issues in the economic sphere. There's obviously even more stark difference in other categories. There's a lot of issues where there's not a stark difference. I mean, forget all that. I don't, that for our purposes right now, I don't even necessarily care about that. I care about the fact that there's one particular macroeconomic issue that is to me the macroeconomic issue that I've devoted the vast majority of well over 10 years now uh, to my economic study, talking about, uh, analyzing, trying to better understand, and that is the excessive indebtedness of the federal government. 
and the debt to GDP ratios, annual budget deficits, and then the impact of all of the above to economic growth and economic growth expectations. So this is a hobby horse of mine for very good reason with a lot of impact and relevance to investors. Okay. That's the one issue that I don't think is on the table in this election whatsoever. I don't think that there's anyone, if one is one of the biggest fans of President Trump, one of the biggest fans of Vice President Harris, and, and they have they really like this policy portfolio over this one, all that, no, no problem. But I don't think anyone on either side would say, I expect after four years of either one of these that the U.S. national debt's going to be fixed. Um, if you do, if you do think that, please don't email me. I'm begging you not to. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think I speak for most grown-ups here that this is the major issue that I believe warrants attention, and this is the major issue that I feel very comfortable saying is not going to get attention. It overlaps with entitlement spending, and it overlaps with annual budget deficits. We're running trillion dollar deficits right now um, as our best case. I mean, they end up being one, three, one, four, like we're not even getting it down to one. And that is, of course, without a recession. Uh, if you go to a recession at some point, the deficit probably blows out a lot more as the revenue, the tax base will, will drop substantially. Um, look, wow, we're going to see 200% debt to GDP at some point. The question is just when. Um, I think that any left-wing, right-wing take uh, is going to agree with it. That's where we're headed. And so if it's unavoidable math, barring a really significant intentional effort to keep it going, then you know I think you're looking at this as being a, an issue that might be a real controversial one relevant one in 2028. It just isn't in 2024. And so uh, I, that's just an early takeaway I want to share. Um, and then just a kind of statistical factoid. It did take us in our country 232 years to get $10 trillion of debt. Um, it took nine years to get the next 10 trillion. And it took four years to get the next 10 trillion. And now we're adding, you know, another trillion or two every three months, seven months, eight months. So, um, you know, there's an exponential component to this as well. By the way, the, the treasury that, uh, you know, has this debt primarily through treasury bills and treasury bonds. Um, there's one concern people throw out that, well, how are we going to pay? For, how are we going to raise the money for the debt with foreigners stop buying it? But, you know, we have of public debt, $27 trillion uh, plus change. And China has reduced their holdings of treasury debt by maybe $400 billion soaking wet over about nine years. And, of course, banks and investors and domestic savers and insurance companies have significantly higher weightings. So... I continue to not really believe that there's a story as to who will buy the debt, but I very much understand that there's a question about the rotation of who that buyer may be. That there are times when sovereign wealth funds, for currency reasons, want to buy, and uh, they're you know foreign owners. There are times when central bank wants to buy. There are times when private economic actors want to buy. But um, I, I don't worry about the appetite for the debt. The other issue that sometimes will come up is the cost of the debt you know, because interest rates are so much higher that it's represented a much bigger impact to annual outlays of the Treasury. And that's very true. Um, you know, we were spending about a billion dollars a day in interest five years ago, and we're spending two billion dollars a day now. And so that's a big increase in the amount of interest expense. But 22% of the treasury debt that is outstanding is in T-bills, very short-term maturities. Right now, those have been costing about 5%. If the futures market is correct, that the, uh, the Fed funds rate will be at 3% a year from now, 22% of our total treasury debt is about $6 trillion. A 2% difference is $120 billion a year. So my friends, that is why I've been such a believer 
that the Fed has to accommodate the Treasury. Uh, may not want to, may, and it may very well be in certain scenarios that they shouldn't, but I'm not referring to what they want, and I'm not referring to what they should, I'm referring to what they will do. And this, to me, is the uh, answer. Um, okay, the, the chart of the week shows you this week the valuations of just the tech, media, telecom type uh, sectors in the market, and then the overall market without tech, media, telecom. And you can see the overall valuation I bemoan in the S&P 500 is not all parts of the S&P 500. There are some that are very fairly valued or historically valued and other pieces that are, are, are bringing that total valuation to the top. It's a great chart for you to look at. I'm going to let it go there. I hope you have a wonderful Labor Day weekend. I'm going to uh, do my Monday edition of Dividend Cafe on Tuesday. I'll be back in New York uh, next week. So I'll look forward to being with you uh, Tuesday back in the Dividend Cafe after the Labor Day weekend. Uh, go USC, fight on, and have a wonderful Labor Day weekend, everybody. Mm -hmm.